You know her from Third Rock from the Sun. You know her from Kate and Alley. She won two Emmys for that. And of course, you know her as one of the original not for primetime players on the National Broadcasting Corporation's Saturday Night Live. Will you please welcome to the stage the one, the only, Jane Curtin. Hi guys. Uh, Hi my peers. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Well, I, I have to say, it's so exciting to be here with you. It's so exciting to have selected shorts back in town. Uh, you know, uh, I've, uh, I've been on our public radio station for almost 30 years and uh, do the fun drives. And one of the things that drives those drives are people supporting selected shorts. It's always one of their favorite programs. And so... It's my favorite program. The fact that you're here and making content is wonderful, and we thank you very much for, for doing that. Every time Selected Shorts calls me, I am so grateful, as are most of the actors, no, all of the actors that get the phone call. It's the best feeling in the world to read people stories, and these are people who want to be read to. So everybody gets something out of the experience. The actors from for doing something that we were saying earlier is not about them, it's about the story and the audience that wants to go along with the story. And sometimes in New York at Symphony Space, you look out at the audience and they're just lying back with their eyes closed, <laughs> having a wonderful time. It's just, <laughs> it's yummy. <laughs> How did you first get started with, uh, with Isaiah? And, and Isaiah get... called me out of the blue. Yeah. Just called and said, would you ever want to come up and read a story? I said, what do you mean come up and read a story? <laughs> he said, well, I have this, this um, there's a theater uptown and we do, we do uh, short stories and actors read them. <laughs> <laughs> we read them. We don't have to memorize them. <laughs> no, nope. you read them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up and I, they, they gave me this story. It was um, George, St. George and the Dragon. Oh. And it was, it was a story that was just so wonderful to me. I, as soon as I started reading that story, when I first was handed it, I thought, oh, yes, I know exactly where they're going and I know who these people are. And, and it was, it was just, I was, I was hooked from that moment on. And, and, and Isaiah and I would do Thalia Follies together. Um, I can't, I guess I was Sarah Palin and he was Henry Kissinger. <laughs> oh, the old days. Oh, the old days, exactly. It was so much fun. And, and about how long? Do you know how many years ago that was? Oh my God, I think my... Probably over 30. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. it was over 30 years ago. That's really wonderful. So. You, uh, I get a sense, and I don't know if this is true or not, but you maybe for a while have been at this point in your career, but you, you do what you want to do, right? I've always done what I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you can. And you can. You don't have to be a jerk about it, and you're going to lose a lot of money, but you're going to have a life, and you're going to have a family, and you're going to have control of your life, and, uh, but I've kept working. They know that, that uh, I don't do a lot of things, and I keep working, and I'm so grateful I'm still walking on eggshells thinking, oh, one of these days they're going to get me, they're going to get me, I know they're going to get me, but I've had it all on my terms. And now all isn't, you know, an island in the Bahamas. All is, I've got a house, right. I've got a lovely husband, I've got a wonderful daughter and, and a wonderful son-in-law and three beautiful grandchildren, a great dog. <laughs> 
What Come kind on. of dog? Life is good, Golden Retriever. Oh, great. What's the dog's name? She, her name is Nui. She was named by a two-year-old. Okay, that's good. That's... <laughs> But that seems to me a lovely way to have a career, of to, to say, okay, at what point were you in it that you were able to do? I mean, you said you always have, but, always have. but was it, I mean, obviously, I would assume success helped that, that, that gave you a little bit of a cushion. No. I did it as soon as I was on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, okay. I was not successful before then. I was working, Yes. but I wasn't successful. I mean, I was working from time to time. I would do plays and a commercial from time to time, and that would be great. But no, I was struggling just like everybody else was. But when I got on that show and I saw how they were doing it, I'm thinking, this isn't, no, this is crazy. Why are they coming in at 7 o'clock at night to write until noon the next day when they could do it? <laughs> they could come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and work until 7 if they wanted to do that and have a life. Right. But that wasn't the point. The point was you, you couldn't have a life and do that show. It was too intense. And um, it was intense because you had to go up on a Monday and, and start pitching and pitching and pitching and pitching and pitching. So you were selling yourself and selling yourself and nobody knew who anybody was and nobody knew what anybody could do. And so there were, um, Gilda knew the, the Lampoon people from uh, Toronto. Lorraine uh, knew Lorne from the Groundlings. And I, I didn't have, I didn't have a, uh, a buddy um, to, that I could pitch to. And I figured, they're not going to listen to me anyway. They don't trust me. And they won't trust me until they see me do something. And so I'm wasting my time going up there, you know, doing the dog and pony <laughs> show. And, and everybody's going, yeah, 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 okay, bye. And, and everybody else is, is pitching their stuff, and their stuff is getting on. And I thought, okay, this is not making me happy. So it's pointless for me to go up and sell myself. They're stuck with me. They hired me. So they have to give me something to do. Otherwise, what's the point? And they, they weren't going to start changing the, the cast around after the second show. That just didn't make any sense either. Uh, so I stopped going in on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I started going in on Wednesdays for the read-through. And fortunately, I'm a really good cold reader. So I could look at a script and I knew exactly where it was going and what I had to do. Yeah. And I would go in there and I, my point of going in there was not for me to get work, it was to sell the script. That was what I thought my job was, to sell that script and I did. And so, the more I did that, the more work I got. And the, the more, more writers they, wanted you. And the more they trusted me. Yeah. So I didn't necessarily have to go in and pitch to them, but they would include me in sketches because they knew I could do it. Because they saw me do it in the read-throughs. I've heard you say this before, that the, the whole point of that show at that time was the guest host. That basically you were just the window dressing. Exactly, As yeah. the cast. Yeah. And, and do you realize that right away? It, that had to be. It didn't have to take very long, but it had to be in order to, in order to sell that show to an audience, there has to be a draw. You can't just say it's the not ready for time right players and you've got all these faces up there going. <laughs> it's terrifying when you see that. Right. But if you have somebody that's really interesting and somebody that people like, like Steve Martin or Buck Henry or somebody that was important at that time, and um, so it would draw in the audience. So they were, they were the hook, they were the hook. And then, you know, eventually we didn't need the hook anymore. And the hook became more of the fluff and we became more of the draw. And you were there long enough to see that. Oh yeah, oh it happened yeah. very quickly. Yeah, because of, again, going back to those, some of those iconic skits, skits and and, and just the basic that you would personalities do. of the people on the show 
Yes. They were larger than a lot of the scripts. So it, <laughs> it, you didn't know what was going to work and what wasn't going to work necessarily, but you always knew that the effort was going to be interesting. When you, when you got Weekend Update, was, was that, oh, okay, well, this is something I know I'll be doing every week. I mean, that must feel good. I didn't have to worry anymore. I didn't, there was one show, Jill Clayburgh, and I loved Jill Clayburgh. Jill, she was a neighbor of mine, and uh, Jill was the guest host, yes. And um, I had two sketches, I was in two sketches in Read Through. And uh, on Saturday afternoon, we rehearsed the sketches. Then we went to dinner, and they did a we did the dress rehearsal, and they cut a bunch out of the show. And my two sketches were cut out of the show, and I I, I had no reason to be there. And the problem with that show, the problem with live television, for me, I don't know whether other people had this same reaction, but I felt the need, because it was late at night and I'm a morning person, I felt the need to keep my energy up during the day, so I would keep working on my adrenaline, you know, and getting up to that performance level. And when the band starts to play at 11.15, and you're just, you're at a point where you are shot out of a cannon. And I had no place to go! <laughs> and it was so frustrating and so horrible, it was actus interruptus. <laughs> <laughs> And so I said to Lauren, I said, I'm going home because I think I'm going to cry. And he said, you can't. You have to stay here. You won't get paid unless you're on the show. And I said, how can I be on the show if there, I can't be on the show? And he said, the good nights. I had to wait through all of that going, eh, so you, until the you good nights. So you would ultimately get paid for saying goodbye. I didn't even say goodbye. I waved in a wedding dress. <laughs> Uh, and, and that just must be, well, as you said, you feel like you're going to cry. But well, yeah, it was hard. It was yeah. hard because you are prepared. You are prepared to go and, and to do what you're supposed to be doing and run around and have people take mustaches off your face and put wigs on and stuff. So when you were in it, you're doing what was the most sketches you would ever you'd ever do in a show? I have no idea. Maybe four or five. Four or five. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that has to be more than exhilarating. So much fun. Yeah. So, the 90 minutes was so much fun. I'm a sprinter. I don't go in yeah. for the long haul. I like to run it and, and, and do it, and get it over with and go home. And um, that's what it was. It was 90 minutes of, whoa! And you'd run under the bleachers and you'd be taking your clothes off and putting another costume on and people would be fussing with your hair and you'd be looking at the lines and you'd be doing this and getting mic'd or something and, and then you'd be shot out onto, the, onto the, the set. I find this interesting and, um, <laughs> and I hope I'm not the only one. <laughs> Uh, but I, I find it interesting that you're, you, you came out of improv. Yeah. So many of the cast uh, members then and now yeah. come out of improv. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, you say, the actual show, there's very little improv. Yeah, it can't be, because it's, it's, it, it's, it's time dependent. You can't cut the commercials and you don't want to stop a sketch before it ends, no matter how long that ending comes. <laughs> it takes a long time to end a sketch, but you don't want to cut it. So um, you have to depend, once, once the show starts, it's written in stone, you know. And you're there. Pretty much, unless you speed it up and so that you can say something and then cut it back down again. But it's time dependent. And then rehearsal, would that be a time where you could work out the mm -hmm. material? If you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. And how willing, how much did the writers like that when you would say, okay, I'm... Depended I'm'm... on the writer. <laughs> it did. They're, you know, they're people. And, uh, yeah, there were some, there were some actors that, that uh, liked more input and some that liked less. And it really, yeah. And, and if, my understanding is, is in that scenario then it's really the writer who becomes the producer and director of that particular segment. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. That's exactly how it works. Yes. The director is there to basically as a, a, uh, a traffic cop. He's, he's, because 
the cameras back then were enormous. They were so huge. And we had a crane um, on, a, on a, a platform with wheels or dolly, I guess, and, and that you had to make room for the crane. And so it was all about, and the, the platform that the uh, sound engineer was on was, was all through the, the studio. So it was very, very busy. And uh, the director was the traffic cop and, and did where the cameras went and, and the writers would come in and they would, they would give you notes about, uh, about the set or this, the scene that you were doing. And occasionally Lauren would come in, uh, not very often. What was your relationship like with Lauren? I didn't really have a relationship with Lauren because uh, he, he, uh, he, he um, was not on top of the situation when it, when it came to, to John's health. John Belushi. Mm -hmm. and, and what was going on in the, in the drug use. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, he, so you come to him and say, look, this, is, this thing I is said, happening. He, this, he, he's, he's, he's out of control. And he's, he's been in my dressing room. He's gone through my purse. He's taken things. Uh, he set your loft on fire. Um, and uh, he doesn't come to work. He, he set Warren's loft on fire? Mm-hmm. No, I didn't have a loft. Yeah, no. But, but you would think most people, like that would probably, you'd lose your job over that. Yeah, you'd think yeah. that. <laughs> I, I would think, but but um, I don't think they I don't think they went to Catholic schools, Joe. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's a big difference. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so then you, you so then um, but you have to communicate with him somehow. So no. you well you okay you don't have to but if you had to you went through Gilda. Yeah. Yeah, and and how did that work? Fine. <laughs> So you would say, I want to do this? No, no, I never said I wanted to do that. I, oh. was, I never, ever Or if they said, said something, I want to do they something would go to Gilda. Saturday Night Live. Never, ever said that. I yeah. just took what I got. Okay. And then, uh, and then if they wanted something, they'd go to Gilda, Gilda would tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And that worked fine. Great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is one thing that fascinates me, though, because you, you would say, uh, you, you would come in and... But Lauren wasn't Lauren then, right? I mean, oh, Lauren was always Lauren. Now, see, how did that happen? Lauren. So just through through the groundlings becomes. No, no, no. He wasn't in the groundlings. No, but, but he, he was. He knew people in the groundlings, so he knew who Lorraine, and they had socialized in California and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. No, he, Lauren, um, Lauren grew up loving comedy. He was Canadian and he lived near, um, there was a, a show, uh, Wayne and Schuster, mm -hmm. two comedians in Canada, very popular. Yes. They had a TV show and Lauren was in awe of these two guys and just in awe of the whole idea of comedy. He loved the idea of comedy so much so that he ended up marrying Schuster's daughter. Uh, Rosie Schuster, who was one of the writers on Saturday Night, was his ex-wife. Is that less creepy than it sounds? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um, but it was uh, Rosie. I, I love Rosie. She's she's really an interesting woman. I like her a lot. Um, but he then came. I don't know. I guess he did stand up maybe in Canada. Uh, but then he came to. LA, as most Canadians do, and he he's got into producing somehow, and he ended up producing a TV special for Lily Tomlin, and um, it did very well, and so he puffed himself up and puffed himself up, as you have to do in Los Angeles, you have to sell yourself, and uh, he eventually got this platform on NBC and and uh, I don't I'm not really sure of his of his biography but I, I, I don't think he has much of a sense of humor which he understands humor but I never saw him laugh never so 
<laughs> What's the last conversation you had with them? I know it was at a funeral. I, no, no, it was, it was, I said, hi. And he said, hi. It was across a restaurant. Hi, hi. That's okay. fine. No, no, no it I is don't, fine. I don't hate Lauren. No, no, Lauren no, no, doesn't no. hate me. We just no. don't communicate. There's no reason to. Yeah. Uh, we did, was it awkward in the 40, at the 40th anniversary? No, it was great. The 40th was great because we all felt, there was a feeling when you were uh, uh, on, on the show that it was not, it, it was more about the star. It, it was, you, you were not treated the same way as the star. And um, I can remember the, uh, after five years of working on that show, I thought, well, at least we'll get great parting gifts. And what we got was a tin replica of the 30 Rockefeller building with a little thing on the bottom that said, nice working with you. <laughs> now that to me was funny. Do but you, it was also still... a little disappointing. Because... Do you still have it? I don't think so. No. Probably broke. I've moved a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but then at that time, you knew when it was time then to go. At the end of the contract, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah, you had to. It, because it was so intense. And it wasn't just the way that the, the working situation was intense. It was intense because of people's responses to you. It was intense because we had been created as something that we should not have been. We were not superstars. Maybe John and Danny, to a certain degree, were yeah. because of the Blues Brothers. Um, but the rest of us, no, we weren't. We were actors that people knew who we were, and, 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 but we weren't scary. And you'd walk down the street in New York, and people would be afraid of you. You'd walk by them and they would shake. And it, it, you didn't know what to do. You didn't know what to do because that, you, didn't, you weren't doing that. You're yeah. just you. How many times did you get called an ignorant slut? <laughs> One time I was called an ignorant slug by a seven-year-old boy. Oh, now that's bad. That's the best. That's the best. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's part of the, the, that, I mean, I guess that is a blessing and a curse, that you have something that people I, uh, instantly identify you from. No, Other it's a curse. It's a curse, always no, a curse. Well, 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 are we talking, are we talking just uh, a success of the sketch, or are we talking specifically about the slot part? <laughs> no, we're, t we're talking about catchphrase, a yeah. catchphrase okay. that is associated with you. Henry Winkler has had to have people go up to him and go, hey, hey. <laughs> For almost 50 years. Right. That's a long time. And what are you supposed to do? Oh, aren't you funny? Yeah. No, it's been going on for 50 years. And he still hasn't and killed anyone. It doesn't. That's no. amazing. No. Uh, but, and then uh, you had that, of course, you had the Coneheads, mm -hmm. and, and uh, which is, uh, I don't know, blessing or curse. Uh, the Coneheads is a, a wonderful movie. Yes. A wonderful movie and a sweet movie. I hated that thing on my head so much. I hated it. Had it gotten every better it? from the time you were doing the TV show to the time you did the movie? Yeah, yeah. When we first did it on the TV show, they were using a different um, formula that was quite heavy. Yeah. So, and they would use, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, some kind of glue, some kind of glue that they would just sort of glue it on. And I was highly allergic to the glue. Mm. So they would put it on and I would say, I won't move my head, just don't glue it, just don't glue it, I won't move my head, I promise you I won't move my head. Look, 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 I can dance, I can do anything, I just won't move my head. And they'd say, no, no, you have to glue it. And so I'd get out on stage and I could feel the welts building up in the back of my head. And I would just rip it off and the hair, I took about 20 years for the hair to grow back in the back of my head. Uh, but then when we, by the time we did the movie, it was much lighter. I still hated it so much. Um, Dan's 
would, because he'd have it on all day long, would fill up with sweat. So at the end of the day, it would go, <laughs> and he would ju he would have they would have to cut a little hole in the bag and let out steam. Sort of. <laughs> Somebody it's had like to go a little drain. volcano. <laughs> Somebody had to go drain Dan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's nice. Um, <laughs> and and you enjoyed working with Dan. I love Dan Aykroyd. I love that man so much. He's just a he's a decent soul and a. He's a good friend and a, a brilliant man, a brilliant writer, a brilliant performer. I just love him. Bill Murray? Love him. Yeah. Love him. He reminds me, he, he should be my brother. Um, Chevy Chase? Don't love him? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, not, not a decent man, not while well, I knew him, but he well, maybe now, I don't know, but we were not friends. We did not get along well at all. I found him to be difficult. I only I have only had dealings with him three times, and all three times were miserable and horrible. He's hard. He's yeah. hard. And I did a, a a pilot out in Los Angeles a while ago, and um, we were shooting on the beach, some beach somewhere, uh, and there was uh, the crew that was shooting this pilot had all worked on Community. Oh, and so, so they were one support group. day I was I was out there getting some lemonade. Then I was drinking my lemonade, enjoying the beach, and, and so one by one they would come up and go, was Chevy as big an asshole as Saturday Night Live as he was on community? And I'd go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yes he was. Yeah, he was. But, you yeah. know, we all grow up and change, hopefully. And, and then that brings us back to John Belushi, who I think, it, I guess it's probably harder to say because of... of um, what he went through. I mean, I, you. I, I knew him before he did a tremendous amount of cocaine. Yeah, I, and, and 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 he was there was a sweetness oh, there. Oh, he was he was delightful. He was yeah. delightful. We were both uh, up for the um, original Saturday Night Live. Which oh, the was Cosell the Howard, one. The lovely Howard Cosell show. Oh. And um, he wanted to have a rep company, and so John and I were were. Uh, the Howard Cosell rep company. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it was John and Chris Guest and me and uh, Brian Murray, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and we would have to go up, uh, what was his name, King, the comedian who died. Alan King? Alan King, he yeah. was producing. So we would have to go up to Alan King's office and sit on the floor. Oh, while at he, his feet. Well, yeah. Well, he sat behind his desk and told us what was funny. And he said, actually said to us, you know what's funny? Toilets. <laughs> Hysterical. Hysterical. <laughs> Toilets? <laughs> Hysterical. You'll see. You'll see. That was basically what we learned from Alan King. <laughs> Who actually, this was during the uh, gas crisis, and he actually left his Rolls Royce running, the engine running, outside of his office. Oh, that's a All good day move. long. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and, I mean, he came up, he was a Borscht Belt comedian, he, you know, he, yeah. he came up, yeah. through, and that was... Uh, I mean, I guess he was only famous, uh, not only, but was most famous for doing stand-up, right? Stand-up, I mean, yeah. What, yeah, just yeah. Doing but stand -up. I, knew, I knew a lot of those. I knew Carl Reiner. I knew Billy Persky. I knew a lot of those Bush oh, Belt guys. Billy that, Persky. Oh, I adore him so now, much. Now, I got to spend, I got to have lunch and spend a, a day with him. I love And him he so. is an amazing man. A he spirit. Was, He's such a he spirit. He is a spirit. Now, he was responsible for Kate Nally. Kate Nally, Nally yeah. Yeah. Now, as uh, how did you first meet? Uh, on the set of Kate Nally. <laughs> okay, so you didn't know him prior mm. to that. No. Mm -hmm. And and because he had he had already had this amazing career. Had uh -huh. worked um, with uh, that girl, Dick Van Dyke. Yep. He did that girl. Yeah. Um, worked with Danny Thomas yep. in those productions. Yep. So yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, w had such great shows to his credit. Yeah. Uh, so he did not trust me at all when we first met. He actually, he when we were in the, uh, we were reading the script before we started rehearsal, and um, it wasn't very funny 
and uh, it needed punching up, and, and uh, most scripts do in the beginning. You just don't know what they sound like until people start saying the words. Um, and uh, after the script reading, he came over to me and he said, okay, okay, now I want you to do is I want you to speak Yiddish, but think British. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, this is, we're talking comedy here. Speak Yiddish, think British. I have no idea what you're saying. I have no idea what that means. Explain it to me. And he said, well, you just have to understand comedy. So what he's saying to you, using the Alan King method, is it's not a toilet. Exactly. It's a, it's a loo. <laughs> Thank you. You knew, you knew. But um, it, it took, again, it took a while for him to listen to how I did the scripts to trust me. And because, you know, Saturday Night Live was a huge phenomenon. But were we any good? We didn't know, he didn't know. You know, people liked what we were doing and it was a big sort of rock and rolly kind of thing. But he didn't know. And I didn't know if I could do this kind of stuff. Um, we, we learned each other through rehearsal. Kate and Allie was a, was a lovely show. Mm -hmm. We did almost five seasons of that show uh, with Susan St. James. Mm -hmm. who, and, and you had different backgrounds, right? I mean, you basically came from different places. No. Comedically? No, both. Oh, actors. comedically. Oh. Um, well, Susan didn't start out in comedy. Susan was a model. Yeah. And then she became one of the last of the contract players. Of the studio at, system. Of the studio system. So she was jobbed into, she was just as cute as a bug. She was so cute. And she would go into these, like, westerns, uh, like the, the Virginian or something, and, and, and she'd be there riding on a, a, a buckboard, and, and uh, she just was so damn cute. And she was adorable, and she was a terrific actress, and, but she never did anything. They never gave her anything to do, except be cute riding on a buckboard. And so then she did, I think, famous, the name of the game was the first one she did, which was a, a, a dramedy, an hour-long yeah. Thing and then she did Macmillan and Wife Macmillan and, and Wife Macmillan and Wife. She ventured into comedy, yeah. and it was it was scripted and, and it was great. And and uh, then Susan and I, before Kate and Ellie, did a movie together, and it was Susan and Jessica Lang and me, and it was a comedy, and um, we had so much fun making this movie. It was a stupid little movie. I mean, as as most movies at that time were. Um, and, and it was three women who, who decide they're, they're all hard up for money, and they decide to rob a bank, and uh, they do. And it's just, we just, we shot it in Eugene, Oregon, and um, the, the, the crew was so loose, and the producer was just hysterical, and, and, and we would go on, uh, they gave me a it was my birthday, our first day of shooting, and they gave me a bike, and so the other girls had to get bikes too. And so on our days off, we'd ride the bike trails all over Eugene, Oregon, picking blackberries, and Jessica had her dogs with her, and we went whitewater rafting. I mean, it was so damn much fun. And then we'd shoot little things, and you'd just like, but it was a dumb little movie, but we had a ball. And, and then you do this show, and you, you hole up in the Ed Sullivan Theater mm -hmm. on Broadway in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and that becomes your home. Mm -hmm. and I actually waved when, um, was it Brezhnev? No, uh, Brezhnev. When Brezhnev was in New York at the UN, and Ronald Reagan was president, I actually waved to the two of them while wearing a bathrobe and curlers in my hair. <laughs> Standing on 7th Avenue. Hi! Because <laughs> it was right there at the Ed Sullivan Theater. There oh, you were. they're coming! Okay, I'm going to come up and wave. <laughs> and, uh, and I always, one of the things that I look back on, on Kate Alley and I think of, and I, I, I know you recently did a, uh, not recently, but during the, I think during COVID, you did a, um, a reunion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was really fun to see. But, you know, you had, um, you had young actors who weren't obnoxious. I, yeah. I, that was, seemed amazing to me. Uh, and that's Billy Persky. Yeah. 
and it's also, um, I think Susan and me, and Bobby Armstrong and Milton Burris, the crew that we had, um, were all, you know, settled. We all had families. We all knew what it was like being around kids. I mean, the kids would, the kids would go down into the makeup. It was, and the Ed Sullivan Theater at that time was just skeevy. Oh, it was so gross, and I had to wash my hair in the slop sink. What have said that they had? Farrah Fawcett did too. <laughs> But, Letterman said that they had, uh, at that time, when, when he went into the theater for the first time, there were rats the size of chihuahuas. Oh, yeah, we had to rescue kittens <laughs> from, from the alleyway because the rats were going to get them. So every, everybody had a kitten in their dressing room, a little, you know, little potty thing. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but no, back to the kids. And then, and then, and your, uh, and then your daughter, uh, Tess, is very, is very young at this point, uh -huh. and, and Susan has a, 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 a youngster, yeah. and uh, they bring them, bring them we to had, the set. Bring the babies, bring the babies to the set, and we'd let the babies crawl on the floor, and we would block the show around them. <laughs> Sorry, Tess. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it better, doesn't it? Oh, the kids, Allison and Ari and Freddie would take care of the kids, you know, take care of the babies. Um, they yeah. babysit when they weren't in school. Um, I'm still friendly with Allison, just, she and her husband just bought a, this beautiful bed and breakfast in Lenox, Massachusetts, in case anyone is interested in going to a bed and breakfast. In, um, but uh, they, they moved from California and they now have this bed and breakfast and her Two kids are in school out here, and and Freddie, um, I, Freddie and I exchange recipes online. I mean, oh, we, yeah. well, that's what, yeah, yeah. And and the, and the nurse right? Ari, Ari Ari is, is a now a, a a nurse midwife. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great yeah uh, way to end up. I think uh, being a kid in in show business. They they lucked out. Yeah. They lucked out because Billy, oh, what a generous, lovely man. I just adore him. So, um, there's so much I want to get to and we're running out of time because I want to get to the audience. Um, but, let me ask you a couple of questions. One is, oh, well, first of all, was this ever true? Um, I, uh, my mother, who, who passed away many years ago, but um, my mother and I, I took mom uh, to see uh, to see Paul Newman in um, our town, mm -hmm. and uh, and you were in that show, mm -hmm. and um, and I, uh, you were amazing in that show. That was an amazing production, it was. and it w and and it was, and, and I'm sorry, but you, the first 20 minutes is like that's Paul Newman, that's that's Paul Newman. That's, oh my God, that's Paul Newman. My mother turns to me and says, uh, Jane Curtin is amazing, and I said. I, I know, she really is. And she goes, you know when I last saw her? And I said, no. And this is what I want to know if it's true or not. And, because I can't find anything about it online. Um, she said, I saw her with George Goebel in Last of the Red Hot Lovers. Yes. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. My goodness. So mom didn't lie to me. No, she <laughs> didn't lie to you. No, she didn't. And I toured with George Goebel. Uh, I think we were gone for like two and a half months. And um, I, again, he, I loved him so. He, he was, um, he, had, he had a drinking problem. Yeah. And he would start drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning. And he would be fine all day long. And he would just keep drinking the same amount, at the same amount, of, at the same time every day. And he would get, he would do the show. He never went up on his lines. He was wonderful in the show. As soon as the show came down, he was like, ah, ah, ah. I mean, he could, he, he could barely stand up. I put that man to bed so many times. I would, I would take him up to his room and get the key and open the door and I'd bring him in and I'd put him on the bed and I'd go, good night, George. And just go back in and close the door. And then the day would start again. And he'd be fine. 
Yeah. And, but at 10 o'clock in the morning, he'd have his first vodka. We could sort of see that even in, in Hollywood Squares. Like the first two episodes that were done early in the morning, he was a little more with it. And then yeah. by the third episode, he started yeah. to... Brilliant man. Yeah. We... Um, and so sweet. He seemed oh, just genuinely so sweet. so sweet. Yeah. All he wanted was somebody to play Yahtzee with. <laughs> Don't we all want that? Adorable. And you know, he would talk. He would talk about his wife, and I mean, he was just delightful and and a joy to work with. You um, you mentioned this when you were you were talking about Warren, and uh, it just made me think of 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 Warren seeing Wayne and Schuster and saying, "I I want to do that." What was that for you? What was that? I want to do that. Was there was there a thing on television or or um, a, a, a role, a, 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 a an actor, an actress, uh, something that you wanted that you I didn't think I be. could. Yeah. I didn't. No, we weren't. We, we that wasn't a possibility back when I was young, when I was growing up. It was not a possibility. The possibilities for us were um, teacher, yeah, nurse, marry well, um, secretary. Uh, this is about it. Retail, you could always go into retail or be a stewardess. <laughs> so you didn't think beyond those, those possibilities. But I had a mother, I had a mother who went to Radcliffe during the depression. She graduated in 1935. And I would go to her reunions with her when she would meet her classmates. And I learned so much from them about the world. These were women who, there was one woman that was married, had like 11 children. Her husband was in the foreign service. They ended up in Chad, and she completely redid the library system of Chad while raising 11 children in a foreign country. <laughs> I, these were women that did things. There was another woman. Um, you played Yahtzee? I, no, I didn't. I didn't know how. <laughs> <gasps> but there was a woman, Evelyn Cummings, who um, when she uh, became a secretary to Admiral Reichauer. This is after World War II. And Admiral did Reichauer. Did I just dream this? Did you say secretary? Secretary. Okay, but, all right. Um, but I did with one finger. Yeah, okay. And um, <laughs> because this was all I could be. And uh, <laughs> she actually did the work that Reichau, Reichauer was not well when he was the ambassador to Japan, but Evelyn did all the work that he was supposed wow. to do. She ended up, I think, working at the CIA, I'm not sure, but she was, this, this other woman that I saw out in the world doing something I didn't think women could do. So I thought, I want to go in the foreign service. That's what I want to do. I want to do what these women are doing. I want to be out in the world. I want to do something in the world. I want to go out in the world and be in the Foreign Service. Because we had traveled so much, and we knew so many people who were in the Foreign Service, so I, that's what I want to do. So I applied to Georgetown School of Foreign Service. And the woman who was the head of my high school was committed the day I graduated, but um, she didn't send out any of my college transcripts. So everybody's getting their envelopes. I wasn't getting any envelope. And I finally called the school and said, um, did I not send my, and she said, we cleaned out her office and there were a lot of transcripts that didn't get sent out. So I was stuck. What was I gonna do? So my mother said, go to Northeastern. Go to Northeastern, you can always go to Northeastern. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll go to Northeastern. But in the meantime, my, my, uh, uh, there was some teacher, um, a late teacher at my high school who said, you should do summer stock. You'd like to do summer stock. Mm. I bet you'd be good doing summer stock. You should do it. And I said, I don't know anything about it. And he said, I have a friend at Plattsburgh. <laughs> they do summer stock up in Plattsburgh. I said, oh, okay. So <laughs> I went up to Plattsburgh and did summer stock. And I did... Uh, I thought, I could do this. I could, do, I could actually, I could go and work in regional theater. Hell, I could make costumes. I could do anything. I mean, it opened up all these possibilities of what I could do within this industry, this tiny little you know, regional theater industry. 
and I went back to uh, Massachusetts, and one of the women that I, I met um, uh, doing summer stock was going to be, it was at BU, and she called me one day and she said, there's an audition at um, uh, the proposition, you wanna come with me? I said, what's the proposition? And she said, well, it's an improv group. I said, what's improv? And she said, well, just come with me. And so I said, oh, okay. So I pick her up and we go to this little converted bakery in Inman Square in Cambridge. And it had just started. I mean, it had been open maybe a year and a half. And they converted it into a little theater. And um, it was uh, all Harvard BU people. And um, it was mostly uh, scripted at that time, but a little bit of improv. And so they were holding auditions, and so my friend Amy had her turn, and she went up and auditioned, and, and they said, does anybody else want to audition? And I went, <laughs> and they said, okay, go in the back room and, you know, get a prop or something, whatever you want to do. And I went in the back room, I didn't know what I was doing, I did something, and they hired me and I still had no idea what it was. And so for the first month, I was in the back, not saying a word. I did not speak for one month. But then they couldn't shut me up. I was just, yeah. you know, we did musical comedies, we did operas, we did everything known to mankind. We were great. And you became really well known in Boston. Yeah, we were big fish, little pond. Yeah. You opened for the Grateful Dead. Oh, do you know that was the first rock concert I went to? Really? Yes. Now, were you a fan of the Dead? Yes! <laughs> yes! So, I just, I'm trying to get in my mind of an improv group opening for the Grateful Dead. I have no idea what we did. But, it didn't but I remember being there. <laughs> Oh, it was, it was stunning. It was stunning. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. All right. Well, we have to, I have to get to uh, questions from the audience. Um, maybe someone will, uh, I, I didn't get to Third Rock from the Sun. Oh, okay. Which is, uh, it was a great show. Oh, it was such a great show. John Lithgow. My God. Ah, uh, no, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you know that, um, because I was thinking about this, and I, this is a stupid question, but um, you, you, of course, did uh, SNL uh, in New York. You did Kate and Alley in New York. So did, what did they have to do to get you out of New York to come to, to L.A. to do that show? I said I would do seven. Yeah. I said I live in, I, I live. Seven on episodes. East, yeah, I live on the East Coast. I, I, can't, I can't commit to seven years, Bonnie. I live here, but I can certainly help you any way I can. So I went out and I did seven shows. And then I said, please, can I stay? Please let me stay. And they did. Yeah. And it was, it was so wonderful for all of us, my whole family. My daughter was in a school that she hated. She was a middle school and she was just a depressed middle schooler. And uh, we had moved out of the city and we were up in, in a place where there were no non-white people and she was used to the village and, and it was, I don't know who these people are. And uh, so I commuted the first year because I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't know what the show was going to be successful yeah. or you know what was going to happen. And I broached the subject with them and I said, what if, and they said, yep. <laughs> We're ready. We want to go. And so we went out there, and it changed my daughter's life. She ended up going to a school that she rates as a 10. This is her wow. high school. A yeah. teenager rating something at 10. That's good. Yeah. And um, she still has friends that she, she moved oh, out lovely. there. After yeah. college, she said, I can't, I can't stay here. I have to go back to L.A. And it's, it's worked out wonderful. She's very happy. She's, she's got a wonderful husband and just three adorable kids. That you get to see fairly regularly. Not fairly regularly. No. But, no. No, but no, they no. just left. They were here two weeks ago. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Who well, has a question for Jane Curtin? I think we have microphones There's here. There's one right there. One right there. Yes, go ahead. John Lithgow in leather pants. 
We did an episode where he was trying to either be younger looking or cooler looking. And they had him in these leather pants that were like, well, I mean, it was skin. It, they were so tight. And he got up to walk, and I couldn't. I could, it, it took, oh my God, it took a long time, because when I go, I go. And there's, it takes a long time to get back, and then they have to clear the mascara off the bottom of my cheeks. I mean, I'm a, I'm a mess. So that's why I can't do it very often. But, you know, sometimes it's... Uh... And he just seems solid as a rock. John, oh, yeah. John, what a joy. Yeah. Just a joy. Joe. Yes. Right here. Okay. <laughs> At the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live, uh, Bill Murray thanked the head cameraman, Al Camoyne, who was in the hospital. It's my uncle, oh. great uncle. And I didn't get to know him much because he, always, he was always working. And if he wasn't working Saturday Night Live, he was, he was doing yeah. NFL on Sunday. Wow. So it seemed that to do that, that the relationship between the cast and the crew must have been something special. I was curious if you have a story about that that you might be able to share and I could pass along to my family. I, don't, I, I, can, I can give you tidbits. There, there was a guy that, um, uh, I think he was an electrician, but he also cooked for the crew. And so on, on Saturday nights when we were doing the show, there was always a, a, a pot of red sauce and macaroni backstage. And every time I would have to make an entrance, he'd stick a spoonful of macaroni in my mouth. And I'd be going, oh, I'm getting the sauce off my face. Other times there was Ferraccio and, oh, what was his name? Bailey. And these, <clears throat> we called them the tons of fun. And they were both weighed over 400 pounds. And they were, um, they were the ones that, that uh, moved the, um, the, the dollies. And uh, Ferraccio, actually, Ferraccio, I picked out his wife's Christmas presents every year. Uh, Bailey, um, Bailey actually, Bailey was weird. Bailey was kind of creepy weird. Um, but Bailey and Garrett had something going where they wanted to pistol whip people. I'm going, ah, this is creepy. Um, that was odd. But I remember, I remember your <laughs> uncle so well. What a great guy he was. He'd let us, Gilda and I would ride his, his, uh, his camera. He'd let us <laughs> take it all over. Oh, man. Oh, what a lovely memory. Thank you. Great, yeah. Jeez, guys, yeah. Right up here. Uh, in addition to you, another one of the great talents that emerged from that era in comedy and television was Robin Williams. Did you ever get an opportunity to interact with him? And oh, can you I, I share any recollections? I knew Robin just from being in New York. Um, and when I was doing improv, uh, uh, we used to have to go to comedy clubs because Bud Friedman always gave us free champagne. So that's why we would go to the comedy clubs. And we'd all, he'd always put a bottle of champagne. And we had just finished a show, so we'd go to the improv. And, and Robin was there a lot, so we'd, we'd hang out with Robin. And, um, I would see him at events a lot, and we'd end up sitting in a corner, you know, because we weren't really into the event, and just chatting away, and what a, just a special man. I, he, it was hard to watch him, though, because he couldn't stop. He couldn't turn it off, and the one thing about improv is that you have to be able to turn it off, because if you don't, you will become the smartest person in the room. You will become the funniest person in the room and nobody's going to want to be around you. And it, that's what happened to Robin a lot of times, because he was so overwhelmingly powerful with his brain that it was exhausting. But he was a lovely guy, just a lovely guy and a dear man. He was just cursed with mm. an active brain. Mm. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you know nobody can remember the name of that show? <laughs> <laughs> the show is unforgettable, is what they were talking about. But go ahead. It was the antithesis of what I've done, but I always I love procedurals. I love it when I'm cooking. I want a good procedural. 
because you don't really have to pay that much attention to them, but you know something's going on and you can catch up in a minute. Um, but I, I just wanted to see what it was like doing it. It's hard. It's very hard. You, you don't have a break and you're sitting there for hours and hours on, a, on location. You're not doing it on set. So the people, when you go outside, people hate you. You know, you're in their way, you're blocking their cars, you're just, it's hard. But it was interesting, I'm really glad I did it. Hi, um, we're, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Saturday Night Live now, and I'm curious, after all this time, do you still feel any personal investment in, in the future of the show and do you think it can or should continue when the time comes that Lauren steps down? I was convinced the show wasn't going to, wasn't going to last when Lauren left, back in 1980. So I'm not a good uh, uh, prognosticator. Uh, it, I have no idea what's gonna happen. Um, there will always be a place for uh, especially political comedy. There has to be a place for, for that. And, and um, uh, there will always be a place for sketch comedy because there are so damn many sketch comedy performers. And they have to have a place to go. Otherwise, they'll make your life miserable. Uh, but it, it, uh, it depends on... Politics has a lot to do with it. Politics has a lot to do with what people watch. And um, when there is a Republican administration, Oh, they love Saturday Night Live. It's just the best. But when things are going smoothly, there's really nothing to talk about. You can, all right, you can talk about aliens, or you can talk, you know, go back to the 18th century and pull something out of that. Um, but it's the politics that keeps, it, that keeps it buzzing, because they're constantly changing. Of the cast, I, I would assume they of the members over the years that they would look to you as as a, a source of inspiration? I don't know. They haven't mentioned it to me. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not. No. I'm, I was just there at the beginning. No, it's you just at the beginning. You're not... It, we were just trying to make it eke out into some sort of form. We were trying our best just to get a form going. So they like got Tina rid of the Fey, Muppets, they got rid of this, they, 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 it started... A Tina Fey never says, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jane Curtin? No, but you know what? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Eve Arden. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Lucille Ball, or... Yeah. or oh, oh, God, the Carol Williams. Nobody ever talks oh, about Carol, Carol Williams. Williams. Carol Williams was in a show with Harry Morgan. Yes, yes, uh, I know his granddaughter. Oh, yeah? Is she nice? Oh, very nice. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> Harry Morgan, of course, from MASH. And it yeah. was a, it, it, she was hilarious. Yeah. A really Big very... Big dimples. Yeah, a yeah. very, very funny comedic actress. Yeah, I, if it wasn't for them, I Eve would... Eve You know, we're all, we're all putting those stepping stones down for the future gender, but we're all doing it. Just by the sake of doing it, you're creating something for the... But, but it seems to me that, that it also means something that if somebody comes up to you and said, okay, but what you did helped me along that path. Then you say, thank you. Mazel tov. I'm glad it happened. But really, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. It, it's, I was just doing my job. So don't put too much weight on it. Would you, would you do a serious comedy anymore? A series comedy? Do a series. Uh, do a, do a I'm series. doing one now. What, what is that? <laughs> oh, what, the Connors? What, no, no. What is it? Something else. <laughs> it's very hush-hush. Okay, it's very hush-hush. Yes. Is it in New York or L.A.? L.A. Okay, all right. And, and do, do, what do you think? Do you think it'll last? I have no idea. Is it, a, is it in front of a studio audience? No. Oh. No. Okay, so that's a different dynamic. It's a different dynamic. But I did, I did one um, called uh, United We Fall. Uh, yes. God, about th four years ago. It was right before the pandemic. So it must have been four years ago. Wow. Um, I did that out in L.A. We did eight. It was fun. I like the form. Yeah. But I don't know whether I need to be in every show. <laughs> 
or in every scene. So this is back to the. I just like to, just let me dabble. Let me play. Just yes. let me play. That's all I want to do. Call play. Jane up. Let her come in. Let her play come in. While. She'll play. Yeah. It's uh, it's been an absolute delight playing with you this afternoon. I've loved playing with you, Joe. Jane Curtin. Thank you.